Yo, welcome back to another episode of On the Spot Sports. I'm Jack, and I'm along with Tyler Dylan, from On the Spot Sports. And uh, in, in today's episode, we ha- we are joined by a very special guest. This guy currently plays for the Danbury Hattricks, the Federal Hockey League, and he's also had stints in the SPHL, ECHL, and he was also a four-sport NCAA athlete at Adrian College. Welcome to the show, Dylan Kelly, a.k.a. DK, the mobility guy. What's up, guys? Sorry for jumping the gun there. No, nah, it's, all, it's all good. Uh, <laughs> we appreciate you coming on. Uh, it's going to be a fun one. Yeah, man, I'm uh, super excited to do this, and uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, how how are you? Doing well, man. Um, I'm from Northern Michigan, so I'm live, staying in Traverse City right now. Um, it's it's starting to get really nice up there. Uh, weather's starting to get better here in Northern Michigan, um, and life's beginning to open up a little bit more here in Michigan too. Um, Cadillac from like Cadillac North, like through the UP, opened up like bars and restaurants. Just some of them like started opening up uh, like last week so it's starting to feel a little bit more like summer in northern Michigan which is super exciting and obviously uh, there's more buzz around the hockey world with the rinks starting to open up and goalies get back on the ice so that's obviously super yeah. exciting yeah for sure are the rinks open by you yet or you still got no there's no I think the the closest there's no rinks open in Michigan yet um, I think we're still in like Honestly, I don't pay too close to the news. It's just that there's been so much going on right now. I just yeah. try to block it out. I don't know if that's the best thing to do or what, but that's what I do. Um, but Michigan hasn't opened any rinks yet. I know Ohio is starting to open rinks, though. So I think uh, like there's guys starting to skate in Ohio. And, um, I might. I think there's one just across the border that's um, not too far from where I'm, where I'm at. So I'll probably check that out if I can. So. Yeah, for sure. It's, your first skate's going to be brutal. Just going to tell you that. Yeah, it's yeah, it's going to be tough. Um, I'm definitely going to feel like Bambi out there. Um, skating's going to be weird. Hopefully tracking's on because I've been doing a lot of hand-eye stuff. But And hopefully the mobility's rocking and rolling too. But skating will probably be a little, uh, little Bambi-ish for sure. Yeah, just being sure. back in all that gear. Yeah, it's it's great when you put it back on after uh, being off for like two and a half months. So it's, it's, good, to oh, feel, yeah. it's good to be back. Absolutely. Can't wait. Yeah, so uh, you played four NCAA sports at Adrian College. So you played hockey, baseball, lacrosse, and tennis. So what was it like playing four sports competitively competitively in college? And did they affect the other sports you played at all, like your like um, game-wise and all that? Honestly, so uh, I was super fortunate to have the opportunity I did at Adrian. Uh, I went there. I, I went in Adrian only playing hockey. Um, on the NCAA team and at the end of my freshman year I joined I like walked onto the te- the NCAA tennis team in the spring um, but I was like a red shirt because I, I walked they, I think the season officially for them starts in the fall like we would play a couple t- couple fall tournaments maybe one or two uh, winter matches winter tournaments and then like the, our main seasons in the spring um, so I was red shirted like my freshman year, um, technically, I guess. I, I just wasn't eligible to play. Um, but, like, practice with the team and whatnot, came back in the fall, played with the team in the fall. Um, and the seasons worked out pretty well with with uh, tennis not really picking up until after hockey season. And um, same thing with hockey season usually starts right when we get there. We'll start having captain's practices and stuff in October. Um and tennis is pretty light in the fall as well, so um, I was it was pretty easy to balance that um, with hockey. My hockey coach Adam Kirk was super. Um, he loved that I was playing multiple sports and super accommodating with that. But hockey was my number one, so um, luckily for me, my other coaches as well were accommodating. They knew going in, hockey was my number one. So if anything overlapped, it was going to be hockey. And they were cool with that and. Um, uh, yeah, it was, it was great, man. But um, spring of sophomore year was when I walked onto the baseball team. Um, and then when I made the baseball team as a pitcher, um, I stepped back like, away from tennis just because playing three at once wasn't doable. So I played baseball um, spring of sophomore year. 
threw quite a few um, innings, actually. I want to say maybe I was a I was a relief guy, so I think I, maybe I had like maybe ten innings, um, and I hadn't pitched competitively in you know two three years, probably since my my U nineteen U twenty ball year, maybe probably my U nineteen year. Um, so I got some innings, which was great, and, then, and came back uh, played junior year as well. Um, had a decent season. Um, loved the guys. Just it was a great group of guys there. The team was super successful. Um, some of my best friends were came from that team. One of them's uh, currently in the Cardinal system as a pitcher right now. Like top thirty prospects worked his way up from like oh. a no draft pick to now he's like top thirty. Yeah, he just killed it his first year last year. Super proud of him for that. But baseball is awesome, it, and it was also just a nice shift after hockey season, right? Because the speeds and like the mentality of both games are just so different. Hockey is very intense, whereas baseball is a little slower paced and laid back back in the, so it was just nice after like a rough hockey season to spend some, spend some time in the sun, um, hang out with, you know, a good group of guys and uh, it still worked on that mental side of the game that you need for goalie, right? Um, yeah. You know, a baseball pitcher, you're on your own out there, right? You're kind of on an island. The only difference is, there's maybe, you know, on a college team, probably anywhere from 12 to 15 pitchers. So if you if you suck, you can get <laughs> swapped out for any one of them at any time, whereas as a goalie, there's only two of us. But um, that was, I think, just the mental side of things as far as pitching really translate with hockey. Um, and then lacrosse, man, honestly, lacrosse was just the spur of the moment thing. I... Going into my senior year, I knew I was going to try and play pro hockey at the end of the year. And had I done that, um, I wouldn't have been able to come back and play baseball on the NCAA team or club team, for that matter. Um, so, I, and once the roster's set, you can't change it. So, I just I kind of went in and had a talk with my coach, my baseball coach, my senior year, and um, decided it was probably best for me to just step away because I would hate to take up one of those few pitching spots on the varsity team and then sign a pro hockey deal and kind of sewer the boys that way. So um, fall of senior year, I played, I just played club baseball. Um, had a great time there. Um, just a lot of fun. Got to play in the field, got to hit a little bit, which in college as a pitcher, you don't do. Um, you're not allowed to touch bats. Like on the NCAA team, like if you're a pitcher, you're not hitting. So it was fun to like play club and just enjoy it my senior year. And then, focus on hockey and um, after hockey season when I was kind of figuring out trying to figure out if I was going to sign if I wasn't going to sign um, I had a couple offers in the SP that just fell through last minute and so it wasn't really looking like I was going to go anywhere and the lacrosse team was terrible at that time had won a game and me and two of my three of my other hockey buddies one had played before the other three of us had not ever like in our lives and but but the one kid was pretty good like played played in high school was like really athletic kid and he set up a meeting with all of us to go talk to the coach the coach was an absolute beauty was like straight up asked us like if any of you guys like played lacrosse before and I was the first one to pipe up and be like never touch the lacrosse stick like the rule you're gonna have to teach me the rules like I know nothing about lacrosse but I promise you right now, if you let me be on this team, I will bring the noise. I will bring the morale and, you know, it'll be a good time. And, you know, you know how hockey guys are. We're outgoing. We're crazy. We're loud. Yeah. And it's just a little different culture. So the coach was like, honestly, you're not going to hurt us. We're 0-6 right now. So, yeah, I'd love it. Like, if anything, it'll just spark the boys and just make things a little lighter and more fun. And that's exactly what happened. Um, I got – I'm not going to say I got decent because <laughs> I definitely didn't get decent at lacrosse, but um, eventually learned how to shoot pretty good. So I had a rip if I had enough time to get the thing off. Um, worked my way up to like maybe top five in penalties, which was cool. And that, then, that's um, <laughs> yeah, not bad. Um, no, no assist. I did get my, I would have to say my biggest highlight was I was net front on my other hockey teammates first and only career NCAA lacrosse goal. So I was pretty stoked about that. Not like that's big deal on that front. Didn't get a piece of it, but I took the goal his eyes away. So <laughs> most bad. important. 
but um yeah man it was awesome like great time those guys were a lot of fun like accepted us right away we're more than willing to like work with us like I when I mean like we didn't know how to play like we didn't know how to play like first practice we were just doing like a simple warm-up passing drill and all like the three of us hockey guys were in the back just like practicing trying to throw it and catch it like it was it was pretty funny um the first week but had a good time we ended up winning one game um and we finished second to last in the conference so we weren't dead last which is great but uh, I played I think I played like six games and then I ended up signing uh with Norfolk and went and finished uh the season with them they only had like one week left of the regular season didn't make playoffs so um Got to play a little lacrosse and make my debut and <laughs> have senior night as a lacrosse player, which is funny. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man. Sorry, I just went on a huge tangent there, but it was, dude, it was fun. Like, um, I never would have imagined I would have had the opportunity to play four college sports, and um, I definitely think it just helped round me as the athlete that I am today. Like, um, I, I truly feel like I can put my mind to something as far as a sport and learn and figure out how to do it. Um, it's definitely helped me become a better athlete for sure. Yeah. I lo- love that. Love it. Love everything you just said there. So uh, it was fun listening to Tyler's our tennis expert here. So I'm sure he has uh, right. some questions about tennis. So uh, Tyler, let him, ru- let him rip. Yeah. So uh, when was the first time that you ever stepped a foot on a tennis court? Um, I played tennis. So I played tennis a little bit when I was younger, um, like in probably like middle school, um, just for fun, like learning how to play. And then in high school, like uh, going into my high school, uh, freshman year of high school, um, I had some buddies who were trying out for the tennis team and it looked like a lot of fun. And I went, I didn't play a fall sport and went home one day, one day and told my parents like, Hey, like I want to try to make part of the tennis team. And um, in Matoski, we have a pretty good program there. Um, that's where I grew up, went to, went to Petoskey High School, and, uh, they were like, uh, all right, dude, like, no, like, I want to make the varsity team, all my buddies are going to be on the varsity team, like, if I'm going to play tennis, i got to be on the varsity team with my buddies, um, and, uh, so, I didn't have a job that summer, so, or a license, so every morning, Morning, my mom would drop me off at the courts at like eight in the morning, and I would just stay there and hit with different guys throughout the entire day. I like had to have a set schedule. Like, have my one buddy meet me, and we'd hit me to ten, and then I had another buddy meet me at eleven to hit eleven to one. And I literally would just sit at the tennis court and play tennis with different guys all day long from like eight to like dinner time, and that was what I did. And I made the tennis varsity tennis team uh, three doubles as a freshman, and then. Uh, played played varsity uh, all three all four years three years actually because I played it was three doubles freshman sophomore year and then four singles my junior year had a sick year that year only lost like seven matches all year our singles lineup was stupid good like all of us had only lost like less than 10, 10 matches all year um, was like number one ranked seed at regional. Uh, had a really good time. Made it, went to states all three years that we were there. Um, made it to the quarterfinals in states. Lost to a, a Detroit um, Country Day kid who was half the size of me and just made me look like a little boy. Um, I'll never forget that experience. But um, yeah, so I started playing tennis. Like I played all through high school, hockey, tennis, and baseball all through high school, and then um, obviously went to junior my senior year of high school. So I didn't get to play tennis uh, my senior year which kind of sucked, but I uh, was able to come back and play baseball my senior year after hockey was over and then played two more years of junior before going to school. So what would you say the biggest difference is for you? I know you said you uh, you started at doubles there your freshman and sophomore year, and then you jumped to singles. What was the biggest difference for you uh, switching from doubles to singles? Um, honestly, I would say just the uh, mental side of it probably. I, I was always – I always wanted to be a singles player and in tennis, they always wanted me to be a doubles player because I'm so big um, and I move well. So just having that big, that front presence um, was, was, was super important for them and obviously very important for being a good doubles team. Um, but I was, for whatever reason, I was never a good volleyer. 
I like, just wasn't a good volleyer. I loved hitting ground strokes, and I always wanted to play singles. But definitely the biggest mental shift was just mentality. You're not, you know, in doubles. Uh, I definitely think the strategy is different. You have different um, structures, different uh, formations that you do on serves, um, serves and returns. Um, whether it's like Aussie where you're stacked on one side or um, I formation, whatever. Um, and just being out there with another teammate, like you need to balance. You know, it's just controlling your emotions that way is tougher because sometimes, sometimes you might be feeling it. You, you're, you're feeling good. You're hitting well, but your partner's not. So you can't be jumping down their throat if they're dumping balls and that making unforced errors. You have to try and pick him up and bring him with you and vice versa. If you know, my partner's killing it and I'm struggling, I can't like just sink in a hole and be like, oh shit, I'm screwing us right now. I got to figure it out and be like, all right, I got my buddy, my, my partner's killing it right now. I got to, I got to, I got to pick it up. Um, and then where singles, once I got to singles, man, I felt like it was, I was locked in. I felt like it was so much easier for me because then it was just like bully, right? It's all on me. It's all in my own head. And, um, I could just rip ground strokes, whereas in doubles, it's like hit a couple ground strokes, get to the net, get to the net. Um, so singles was just – I felt a lot easier for me being able to just control my own emotions, and uh, I could just kind of play my game. Yeah, so you were explaining how you, you really like to hit those ground strokes and singles, and that's kind of surprising to hear that you said you're a bigger guy, you struggled to hit volleys. So that was my next question for you was, uh, this is primarily for singles, because doubles you kind of had – you said you have that, that other strategy. What do you think was your kind of style? Were you more like offensive baseliner, defensive baseliner, or more like a serve and volley kind of guy? Um, I would say I was probably more – I was definitely more offensive. Um, uh, if my ground strokes weren't there, I was, I was good enough that I could just serve and volley, run to the net and just punch some home. Um, but I was a ground stroker for sure. Um, I loved, I was definitely on the offensive side. Um, you know, defensive players, we in tennis, you call them pushers, right? So that was someone I hated playing against. I hated playing against pushers. And for those of you who don't know exactly what a pusher is, it's someone who just is super consistent and just gets the ball back every time. They're the most impossible person as an offensive player to – it's just they're tough to play against because especially if they're quick and they're fast and they can get to every ball, it's just – it makes you have – they just make you be more consistent than them, and that's usually hard to do. Um, but I had, a, I had a hard flat serve um, – in college, I was much better with my second serve. Um, my serve, I would say, was either like – it was hit or miss in high school. It was either spot on, um, and I was crushing my flat serves, uh, my first serves, and it was one of my deadliest weapons, or I couldn't get it and save my life, and I'm stuck um, throwing two kick serves in there just to make sure I get one in. Um, but definitely ground strokes, uh, forehand for sure. Loved hitting my forehand. Uh, slice was okay, but I was definitely, I would definitely consider myself more of a ground stroker. Yeah, so you, you you like to say that you kind of mix up your shots a little bit. What was that like for your serve? Because obviously you said you have the height advantage. A lot of people with that that height advantage really get their serve cooking. So what what would your kind of mentality be when your serve was off? You know, you, you weren't having the best day with your serve. Yeah, so um, honestly, I'll just back off and trust myself. Um, it's no different in hockey, right? Like some days, some days. I mean, we all have our, our toolbox of skills, and some days, some some things are there. Some some days, some whoa, some days, some things aren't. That's a tongue twister. Um, and so I'd always start off, you know, warm ups, whatnot. See how my flat serves hitting. Um, and I always try and start the match with it. If I'm struggling to get it in, then I'll just throw two kick serves. So a kick serve is something that has a forward spin on it. So when it hits, it kicks way up high in the air. So it's harder for them to return. Um, and I'm, I was usually pretty consistent with those. So if my flat serve wasn't working for me, I would just throw maybe a little harder kick on that first one. And then 
Uh, my second serve was just my normal second serve kick serve, which was a little lighter. And if if I had go if I had to go to that, then this is where I feel like I use my pitching mentality. Whereas changing your speeds as a pitcher, you you want to change your speeds so guys can't get timing on you. Whether it's your time between pitches, your set time, or just the speed of your pitches. Um, and so that's if if I couldn't get my flat serve in. That's what I would do with my first serve, kick serve. Sometimes maybe I'll spin one in there, just a second serve on my first serve, or one time, and then maybe the next time I'm kicking it a lot harder. And even if my flat serve wasn't working, I would every now and then throw one in there. Just even if I knew it wasn't probably going in, it just in their mind, it's something they have to think about and honor that. Okay, he could he could be smoking a flat serve here. Um, so that was just a way to um, kind of keep that competitive edge or that edge over my opponent um, when serving if my serve wasn't working because usually my ground strokes were on and I have trust in those. So if my, uh, my serve wasn't on, my biggest focus was just, okay, mix it up, um, keep them guessing in their head and just make sure you get them in so that way you can get to your ground strokes because that's what's working. That's what's going to end up ultimately winning me the point. So, yeah, that's that's a lot of great stuff right there. I, I completely understand where you're coming from there. Uh, when you were explaining when you were uh, were coming up in tennis in high school, going back, I heard you mention that your uh, your three years you made state all three years, and I got to say that's an amazing accomplishment because uh, it's the opposite for me. Um, I. I uh, was in the state qualifying match my sophomore, junior, and senior year, and unfortunately lost all three. And and I never got to feel what making state was. Uh, it was always really important for me. So I want to know from you, making state all three of those years, what did that feel like? Like what what was your like? Just tell me what 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 that what that feeling was all about after you made it. Um, honestly, it, it was almost super surreal because for me, like. I don't know. I never considered myself probably until my junior year when I just started tearing it up. I never really considered myself like an amazing tennis player. Like I was really fortunate to be on a super good team. Like a uh, few, a few guys that I played with ended up going on to play D1 tennis, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, but state was just, it was sweet, man. Um, just, we always enjoyed the travel, like the travel to tournaments and stuff. Um, we were usually playing in like, pretty big indoor facilities because in Michigan it's always it's weather's brutal in the fall for tennis so uh, we ended up indoors a lot but I got to uh, got to go in some pretty cool indoor tennis facilities so that was something I always enjoyed because I, we, I never really did much of that just all my tennis was always outdoors um, but I liked playing indoors so um, I just really liked that vibe that atmosphere that I got from being indoors playing indoors uh, being like a tennis country club, I guess. Um, and just seeing seeing all the talent, man. Like, we were a D3 school, but so at State, we had, you know, the big, the private schools with like, like Cranbrook and Detroit Country Day, um, um, Andover, uh, some other like just big, big D3 small private schools that actually like recruited and brought kids in for tennis and like, it was, it was just crazy to see how good some of these kids were. And we never, you know, in state, I think we had a couple of us that were ranked going into state, like low seats. Pretty much most of us were one or two seats heading into regional. Um, so states, I, I would definitely say, was a definitely a different experience for us being we're just one of another team, not, not the powerhouse Petoskey High School anymore. Um, but it was something that we looked forward to that challenge. And, um, just kind of seeing how far we could get, right? Um, so I think the furthest um, any of us ever made was most of us. Most of us would lose in the second round. Um, there's what? So there's four four singles players, four doubles teams. Most guys would win their first round. Maybe have a couple upsets, um, and then second round guys usually it's usually hit or miss. Um, our singles year. We won. Uh, all of our singles guys made it to the quarters, and then we all lost in the quarters except for one minute to 
I think one made it to the semis or maybe even the finals and ended up losing in like a really tight match. But it was just awesome to see, you know, some of the big names that you, uh, you were hearing in the tennis community. Like tennis community is small, tight knit, just like hockey. Whereas if you're really good, you like everyone knows you. And, uh, you know, if you're someone who's really good at tennis, like I'm going to know who they are. And so it was just cool kind of getting to see these big names at the time kids who are starting to commit to colleges and stuff, um, doing all these big um, USTA tourneys in the summer, um, seeing them live and even getting to play against some of them. Like um, probably the, uh, going back to that story, uh, when I was at States playing in my quarterfinal game, quarterfinal match, sorry, I was feeling pretty good, like was hitting the ball well that day. And I was like, shit, like, I think I can, I think I can do this. Like, I think I could go to at least make it to the semis. And um, I get out there against DCD, and this, I was probably, I was like 6'3 in high school, big kid, um, so had that intimidating presence on the court. I was pretty, pretty intense, would get fired up. Um, and out comes this little tiny, he was probably like 5'5", five, five, maybe, just this little, um, <coughs> little Arab kid. <coughs> I don't mean that in a racist way, but he was Arab. Um, just as like, and he, he had a baby face. He was a freshman, just like this. He was the nicest kid. Just like, oh, hi, like, nice to meet you. Um, just super nice, like, shy baby face. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, and here I am, a junior, kind of starting to turn into a man. So I'm just like, oh, this this is a little kid. Like, this is some 14, 15-year-old kid. Like, I got I to gotta whoop this kid. Like, I got to put it on him. And I kid you not, like, we're warming up. We start warming up. And, like, he's just getting the ball back. And I'm like, yeah, like, this kid's good. But I was like, I didn't think he was anything special. I was like, I, I, you know, my coach comes up after Lawrence. He, she was like, so what do you think? Like, what do you see? And I'm like, I think I can beat this kid. I was like, I think, I think this could be a match. Whereas usually, like, Detroit Country Day was one of those private schools that was, was stacked. And I kid you not, the first set was probably 15 minutes. 15 minutes, this kid kicked my ass 6 0, and, like, didn't even break a sweat and he was super nice the whole match like if I did win a point like I literally think maybe I won two points that whole first set and like I was hitting well <laughs> and my coach walks away five minutes later comes back and it's like 4-0 and she's like what's going on I'm like this kid's this kid's good <laughs> like I don't know like I'm getting balls back he's super fast he got to everything placed everything like deep in the court was just he was sick like the kid was was gross and she was like all right like just start hitting out then which means like hit as hard as you can start trying to paint lines so going for winners so um I started trying to go for winners um the second set went a little bit better I think I won a game lost 6-1 uh but again kid was just super nice and it was I don't know it was just a really good learning curve of like don't judge a book by its cover man and like he played it right like he was nice respectful the whole time just how you should be with tennis and, um, you know, he kicked my ass fair and square. Um, and I, I think he went on and I don't know, I, I think he lost in the finals, but uh, that was just, oh, that was an experience I'll never forget for sure. Yeah, I don't want to uh, make this too long. I know Jack's got a lot of hockey questions left. So uh, one more thing I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, now that you're, um, you're past high school, you're past college with the tennis do you ever plan on like just playing for fun here and there or ever doing uh, anything else with tennis? hundred percent, man. I love tennis to this day. Um, I'm definitely, now that the weather's getting nicer, I, I hope I can find someone to hit with up here in Traverse city. Um, so if you're listening to this and you play tennis and you're in Traverse city, hit me up. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, I, and it's great for hockey players, especially goalies, man. Cause it's footwork. It's hand. Uh, just working I would love to even just do like lessons either run lessons just for fun like rec lessons for kids or um, even do lessons of my own just to stay in the game and stuff like that but yeah man tennis is definitely something I'm gonna keep keep in my life long term yeah I 100% agree with that I love tennis just as much as you do man um I I hope I can play as long as I can too it's a great game uh 
it really gets every every part of that like aspect of like physical activity and a lot of people like don't realize it 100 percent. and it is a sport that you can play like you ask people what are two sports you can play forever tennis and tennis and golf like some of the best ground strokers i've ever seen have been like 70 year old people who just stand at the baseline playing doubles both of them playing two back at the baseline and they just rip ground strokes at each other until someone misses like because they can't move but they still they still have the the strokes so um yeah man tennis is something you can play um, for the rest of your life to just stay in shape and stay healthy but um yeah <laughs> yeah that's, those those are awesome uh stories and awesome experiences you shared there uh, I will say Tyler kicked my ass when I did play tennis with him. So uh, he's, he's way better. Than that was a couple of years ago, man. So he's still probably. Kick my ass. Yeah. So uh, let's get into some hockey really quick. Uh, you played uh, hockey at Adrian college uh, and you com- you compiled a 16 and two record through like all four years of playing hockey at Adrian. So what do you yep. think, what do you think helped you to become so consistent and so good over the years um honestly it was just confidence and belief in myself Uh, I went to Adrian knowing I was going to be a third string I had two senior partners ahead of me but when I got there they were uh it was kind of that shift of they they were seniors so they still played a little bit of an older style of game and I was kind of the first guy at least in our system kind of playing a new school game so I felt like I was going to, I need to use that to my advantage. And, um, they were great mentors for me, great goalies, learned tons of, tons of stuff from them. Um, but I felt like I could beat them out. So, uh, number one thing would just be my work ethic. Uh, I wouldn't be playing pro hockey if it wasn't for my work ethic. Uh, I didn't start playing goalie until I was a freshman in high school. So I was a late bloomer as is. I'm probably still even a little bit behind like, uh, the development curve. I still feel like my ceiling is so high. Um, because I, I am just a few years behind everyone else, but um, work ethic and just that inner belief man, and confidence. I was super fortunate to be on such a great team, and a lot of my success comes from those guys too. Like, it's a lot easier, especially being a backup. Um, like, I was a backup all four years, and it's a lot easier hopping in a game when you're not playing, you know, consistently knowing your team is probably going to put up four or five goals. So um, just every game I went into, man, I, not even just me, our, our team, we just we knew we were going to win no matter who it was. So anytime I was getting the, getting the nod, I, there was just no worry. There was, there was butterflies there because I was excited. I wanted to do well, but I knew I was going to win. I knew the team was going to kill it. And as long as I didn't shit the bed, we were going to find a way to win. So, um that made that made things a lot easier to play. Just my got my team being having uh, so much confidence in each other and having confidence in me. Um, and then senior year was when things just really took off. Um, I felt like freshman, sophomore, junior year, I was kind of just hanging on to. Uh, yes, I knew I could do it, but at the same time, we were when I was in the net, we were winning games, maybe five two or five three, and like I was giving up a goal I, sh- I didn't need to give up and. Senior year was when I really took that next step and was like, okay, yeah, I'm on a good, I'm on a really good team, one of the best teams in the country that can win games 6 5, but I want to be that guy that makes the difference. I want to make the game, you know, I want us to be able to win a game 2 0. And instead of me leaning on the guys, I want the guys to lean on me. And if we're only going to score two, I want them to be on the bench, like, yeah, we're good. DK's in there. He's going to shut the door. So, and things just took off senior year for me. I knew I, I had my mindset. Um, I wanted to play pro hockey, and I felt like I was good enough to be the starter. Um, I played three years with Kevin Edma, who went on to play pro hockey as well. Um, one of my one of my great buddies to this day. Um, he was he was an awesome guy. We had some great times in school, and was an awesome goalie partner to have. Um, incredible goalie as well. Learned a lot from him. Um, but he played the bulk of the games. He came in his freshman year and was, went undefeated and just put up stupid numbers and uh, was a solid all, you know, his entire career at Adrian College. Uh, I would have to say probably 
the best or one of the the best goalies to ever you know go through Adrian College, go through that program. Um, I, I want to say he probably had to have set some records, uh, but that being said, I, I felt like I was just as good, if not better, than him at times. So uh, we had that great relationship, but we also pushed each other to the max on the ice. And um, I knew he was the guy, and I knew he was the guy that everyone had faith in. And I wanted to prove that wrong. I want, you know, I loved Kev. I love Kev to death. But part of you, that inner drive, still has to be like, screw Kev, like screw Kevin, like I'm better than Kevin. I'm going to prove I'm better than Kevin. And I don't. That's not in a mean way or a nasty way. It's it's in the most loving, competitive way possible. And when we had that balance, we had um, that structure within our friendship and within our bully partner tandem. And that's why I was so good my senior year that. Um, we pushed each other so hard, and every time we were in the net, we were trying to prove that we were better than the other guy. And uh, we both had great years, and I think that's that only helped our team push each other the same way and helped all of us elevate our game. Yeah, for sure. It seemed seemed like you guys were just an awesome tandem, and you guys really pushed each other in, in that good competitive way, which also really helps. Absolutely. Yeah, so you said you guys were uh, winning games. So, like, since you guys were winning by like getting like five, four, five, six goals a game, like what would your mindset be like? Especially since you were a backup, so you didn't get that many games. So like, what was your mindset throughout? Like, throughout trying to trying to stay consistent. Like, like how how would you prepare like for a game that you wouldn't that would come like every couple every couple games? Holy crap! I can't speak. No, that's good. I, I get what you're saying. Um, yeah, so I definitely think being a backup, uh, my mind that really helped all four years just helped shape my mindset into what it is now. Um, freshman year, I went in with the attitude of, oh yeah, I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna work hard, and I'm just gonna try and steal some, get some games when I can. Um, and crew would just throw me in at random times. Like there were times where we'd be up three one, and there'd be ten minutes left in the third, you'd just be like, DK, you wanna play? I'd just be like, yep. <laughs> and he would just toss me in there last 10 minutes of the game. Like, it was literally just like letting the dog off the leash and just at random times would, would do that. And it just helped help me build that ability to just be able to hop in a game and play, flip that switch. Um, sophomore year, I think um, – sophomore year was a slower year for me. I thought it was going to be bigger than what it was. Um, and I had some high expectations coming in sophomore year, and we brought in two D1 goalies uh, along with Kevin. Um, so there's four of us. So I started out, um, I don't know, I guess I started out as three, four. Um, they had high, they had high hopes for Kev and uh, Tyler Parks was the other guy who was transferring in from St. Louis or sorry, St. Lawrence, who's now with, um, he's playing in the coast. Um, and so things, you know, I wasn't happy. I knew we were bringing in one, but I didn't know about the, I didn't know about Parksy. So, that was a tough situation, but at the end of the day, like all I had to do was just work hard and earn my keep. And um, by Christmas, uh, or by, probably by like, yeah, probably by Christmas, I was the third string guy. Um, and the other guy was transferring. The other D1 guy was transferring out. And uh, probably by like, you know, a little bit after Christmas, um, it's just, this story is kind of crazy. I just think it's just crazy how things work. But Parksy was slipping a little bit. Like he wasn't having that great of a year. Um, big goalie, tons of skill, but he, um, at the time, I think he just struggled, was struggling with some things, and so he wasn't playing to his best of his abilities. And he knows that. Um, Kevin was tearing it up, but those two guys were still splitting time. Towards the end of the year, Mozzie started taking a little bit more than that. Um, I get gains here and there, whether it's just getting tossed in or a couple starts here and there. Um, I think I want to say I ended up playing in, I think, five games. Um, but Parks, who was a junior that year, looking to go sign and play pro after. Um, and he was having a pretty – like, he was having a good year, still had like a 9-1 save percentage. But you just knew, and he knew, like, he had more in him. Like, the guys – he was one of the best goalies in the ECHL this year, his second year pro, like, there was more in him at that point, you know, transferring from D1. He knew he could play better than what he was, and he was still putting up great numbers. 
Um, but Mozzie was putting up even better numbers. So come playoff time, um, I was supposed to be the backup. And, you know, Kruger told me, hey, if anything happened to happen to Kev, like, you're going to be going in, blah, blah, blah. And, um, right before our um, Harris Cup final game, which is like the con- like the conference finals, the practice before, I get a, I get a concussion. Um, so I'm out. And, or no, this would have been right before our – uh, this was right before. Sorry, this was right before our um, quarterfinal game. No, 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 I'm wrong. Conference final game. And so Parksy's backing up uh, at home. All three of us dress anyways. But Kevin ends up getting hurt. He, he gets cramps. He ends up getting cramps in like the first or second period. Has to leave the game. Parksy gets to play. So here I am, like concussed, kind of bummed out, thinking like shit. Like that was my opportunity. Like that should be me. Parksy goes in there, steals the show, stands on his head against St. Norbert, um, who was, you know, the other powerhouse in yeah. Division Three with us. Stands on his head. Uh, we might have even been losing at, when he went in, and we ended up coming back, winning the game. Parksy played unreal, and that was like, I don't know, I felt like that was a defining moment for him. You just saw his, his confidence lift, and he just knew he was the stud that he is now. Um and he just – he needed that. And hadn't it been for that experience, who knows if he would have had the opportunity. We ended up losing the very next game um, in the national quarterfinal at home against Stevens Point, who went on to win it all. Um, and, you know, who knows? Mozzie ended up playing that game. So that was Parksy's last game of the year, and he killed it. Um, and without that game, who knows if Parksy signs a pro deal at the end of that year and goes on to – to play pro, maybe he has to come back one more year at Adrian, which would have sucked for me because now I'm a junior as a third string again. So, um, you know, it just goes to show everything happens for a reason. And super happy that that, like, that happened for Parksy. I'm super happy that things worked out the way it did looking back now because it benefited my, it just kind of taught me, damn, like, everything does happen for a reason. Like, yeah, like he put up good numbers, but he struggled a little bit and still had a good year. And, you know, a bone was thrown to him and he killed it. He chewed it apart. And, you know, now he's having the career that he is. So I haven't talked to him much, but if you're here in this park seat, super proud of you and uh, keep grinding, keep killing it. Um, but yeah, that was just a really good learning curve for me that uh, everything happens for a reason and that junior year was able to come in and just split time with Mozzie and was like, okay, like now it's go time. Like I got a chance to get some games here. And um, Kevin was having, you know, Kevin was a great goalie. So I knew he had, you know, all the, all the trust in the team and the coaches. And I didn't take that as a bad thing. I was winning games, you know, going into my junior year. I think I hadn't, I hadn't lost a game yet. So um, in my career, so I knew guys trusted me to get the job done too, because I had done so. But um, I just had higher hopes to get more and more games, and I was just hungry. And um, senior year, man, I junior year, I think I maybe put a little too much pressure on myself, and then had a pretty good year, but still knew I could have been better, especially with the team I had in front of me. Uh, we ended up going to the Frozen Four that year, uh, losing in overtime to Norwich. You ended up going on to win it all um, in the finals over and over. And then senior year, man, was just a kind of like tying it all together so had that compete had that kind of okay everything happens for a reason just stay the course sort of deal but was still putting a little too much pressure and then senior year I almost just said like screw it like it's senior year college like let's have a time let's have some fun we're gonna do the right things on the ice off the ice but you know at the end of the day we're not just gonna spend our whole senior year stressing about hockey stressing about trying to get games stressing whether or not we're gonna be able to play pro hockey at the end of it I knew if regardless how many games I got to play this year, if I put up good numbers and I won all of them, I was going to get a, I was going to get a sniff. You know, I was on one of the best NCAA D3 program in the country. I was going to get a shot. So, um, and I knew Krug was going to go for bat, go to bat for me because I was such, I was such a good teammate all four years. Um, And that just kind of shifting my mentality to not care as much 
in a way, if you if you would, and just try and enjoy the experience. I killed it, man. I had the best numbers in the nation. Um, yes, I was a backup. I only ended up playing like 11 games, but um, I think I had one or two games, one game all year where I gave up more than one goal. Like, it was just stupid, stupid numbers. Kevin had a good year, and uh, the team had a, had a good year. We lost in the national quarterfinals again to, to Norbert, who ended up going on and winning it all. But um, I got to play in that game. I got to play about two periods and five minutes of that game. And um, just to get that experience, I'd never played in a, a scene like that. And I went in and I crushed it. We, we were down 3 nothing, and ended up coming back and we lost – or we we're down three to one, three nothing maybe, three nothing, and um, got it to like three one, and then three two maybe, then four two, and I think we ended up losing four two. Um, but yeah, uh, just getting that experience at the end of it was bittersweet. Obviously, like it was, it was great to go in there and give my team a chance to win and play well and. You know, I always knew that I could be in that spotlight and be that guy to just dominate a game like that and never had the opportunity to. And to be able to go in there and to, to dominate but was great, but it would have been great to get the win um, just to be able to do a little bit more. But it is what it is, and it set me up to, to move into pro hockey, which allowed me to just try to keep riding that confidence, man. Warfold came to shot, and that was fun. Uh, just – Tried to go there and be a sponge, soak it in. Wasn't sure if I was going to play. Got to play one period of the last game. Again, just great experience. See what it's like at that level. Start of the year. The following year in Orlando, had a really good camp. Felt like I should have made the team, but their goalies were already signed. They just – there wasn't a contract for me. Went to Fayetteville where I was all, already signed to, to be for the year. and uh, Was able to go there with tons of confidence as a rookie and be a part of a really young team that I just fit in right right away with and uh, the group gelled right away and we had a we had a really fun time there and got to play a ton of games like my fresh rookie year of, you know went from college where I was back four years playing what did you say like I, what was what were my numbers 16 and 2 I didn't yeah. even know that yeah. right on so I play I didn't even get 20 starts in four years of college and then I go in and play 36 regular season games my first year pro as out of 56 games and you know, I got two two games in the coast, so uh, just was it the ideal college ideal college experience? No, I would have loved to play a lot more games, but at the end of the day, it worked out. I learned a ton from it and uh, made a lot of memories. So. Yeah, that was, that story is crazy. Like, especially how it shaped you into being the goaltender you are today. Parksy's story is amazing. Right. Uh, Kevin's story and how good he was like performing was. Is also really good, and like it, you guys are all playing pro now. So I was like, it really like helped you guys and like gelled you guys Absolutely. together, and like definitely helped you in the long run to push for that professional professional uh, debuts. For sure, and just I would even say one of the biggest things that at least that I picked up from Kevin, maybe Kevin picked this up from me, and maybe Parksy did picked it up from Kevin and I as well. But just picking little things about our our mentality, like. I'm a very energetic, as you can tell, I'm loud, obnoxious, just outgoing, but like, I also get damped up. I get, I get pretty pumped up. And as a goalie, you gotta, you gotta stay even keel. So yeah. something in my career is sometimes I'd get too amped up or too fired up. And Kevin was the opposite. Like Kevin's very laid back, super chill guy. Like, um, I, I don't know if you'd ever say that he was chill, but he's just very laid back, like nonchalant and, um, it's just persona. He, it translates on the ice. You watch him move around in the net. Everything just looks so effortless. It's so smooth, um, and it, it, it looks effortless when he moves in the net. And just his, his mentality. Just uh, I really tried to soak that in with from Cab. Just seeing the way he approached the game because him and I had tons of fun off the ice. Um, and I think Parksy learned from that just because Parksy came in coming from a D1 program. That wasn't that great at the time coming to, you know, the best D3 program, had high expectations for himself to move on, play pro at the end of the year, but a crazy numbers is one year at Adrian, not to mention he's coming to a whole new group of guys. Um, so he, he came in and when he was first here, he was super tense. Like you just tell like super focused and, you know, once season started, 
you, you just saw him like tighten up and worry about every little thing and just be like super, super nitpicky with himself. And I think he learned from Kevin that, you know, he's, Kevin and I still worked hard, but we were goofballs and we had our fun on the weekends, just like a college guy should. And, you know, Saturday nights after games, we were having fun. And uh, I think Kevin, or sorry, I think Parksy definitely learned like, okay, like, you know, especially probably more so from Kevin, like Kevin, here's Kevin as a rookie goal center, like hanging out with the third string, like, you know, having a good time all the time, having a good time with the boys all the time, but he was killing it on the ice. And I think Parksy learned like, okay, like you need to loosen up a little bit, like relax a little bit. Like here's Kevin who's enjoying himself and he's putting the work in and he's having the results. So um, I definitely think all those things interlace. Uh, or else you can just – it's very easy to overwhelm yourself. But just picking up little mind mindset things from each other is huge. Yeah, I definitely think that, like, as an athlete in college, you have to have, like, that mix between, like, like when you get to, like, the – when you get to, like, what you're doing, you, yep. you got to, like, pay attention. You got to, like, work. But, like, you also got to have that fun as well. It's like a – a medium. Absolutely, because if you don't, it's just going to – it's gonna swallow you, man. Exactly. If you don't, you're just—it's gonna consume you, and like that's not why you play. You don't—you don't play hockey. You don't play goalie to just stress about the wins or losses, or how many saves you make, or stress about the results. Like we play hockey because it's a fun game, and um, the results are just part of it. Yeah, that's, exactly. That, the results is just what makes it a game, um, and something that was big for me just this past year um, because it is sports anxiety is a thing and we all have so much high expectations for ourselves and uh, we all want to play pro hockey right and uh, it's obviously not not doable for all of us Um, that being said it was just where's it going with that oh we all want to play pro hockey so it's super easy to just get so consumed with it in your head and it can just swallow you whole. Um, so something that really helped me was love over fear. Um, the saying love over fear. Choose your love for the game over your fear of results, your fear of losing, your fear of letting your team down. Because at the end of the day, we all let our teams down. I mean, I was on, you know, Dan Barry, Dan Barry this year, we were, we were the best team in the league and uh, we had something really special there. And I guarantee you at some point, Everybody on the team let the team down. That's just part of hockey. Yeah. You know, you can't play perfect every time. Like, you're going to give a bad goal. Um, you know, as a demon, you're going to get burned. As a forward, you're going to turn the puck over. Like, it's the only difference is it's just so much – it's magnified when it's us because another point goes on the board for the other team, whereas that doesn't always happen when – our position guys make, make an error, but um, that's just something I try to remind myself is choose, you know, choose your love for the game over the fear of what could happen because that's already decided. And if you choose to decide the results in your head, it's probably going to happen. So if you choose to believe like in college, like I knew I was going to win every day and I won every game, like except for two. (laughs) And you know what? That happens sometimes. So, um, And if you're going into a game unsure, thinking you could lose this game, there's a good chance you might do that. And that you're going to give up a goal that is going to lose the game for your team. And I think in that situation, that's a situation you do need to be a little harder on yourself because in a way you you, you put that on yourself. You went into that game with with the mindset that, oh, we could lose this one or I I might hurt the team. And as a teammate, it's up to you to find a way to fight that that you know that talk going on in your head turn it off and flip it into fuck that we're killing this that's not happening i don't know who this guy is trying to tell me we're gonna lose but we're winning this game and i'm gonna kill it i'm gonna they're gonna be talking about me after this game so um it's not so much the result of giving up a bad goal that you should be upset about it's your mindset if you have the mindset of that happening and it happens then it's then it's something you should be thinking about but at the end of the day, uh, we need to choose our love for the game over the fear of what could happen. 
Yeah, ex- exactly. Uh, I want to go to of uh, to your time in the Null uh, for a little bit here, and uh, you played in the South Division for a, for a, a couple games in Corpus Christi, and uh, I saw yeah. you got in a goalie fight. So like, and like yeah. the South Division's known for like being like a very interesting division. So like, what was your experience like that, and like the goalie fight and everything there? The Dirty South, man. Um, it was playing in the South was electric. It was just a bunch of like, you know, we were in Texas, a bunch of, you know, Texas rednecks. Um, I say that, I don't mean that in a bad way. Just like a bunch of country people, right, who loved hockey and like came to hockey games to, to see fights and see big hits and stuff like that. But they were energetic. They were fun fans. Um, usually they were getting pissed drunk and causing a ruckus in the crowd. So wherever we were playing, it was usually like a fun atmosphere. Um, and yeah, tons of fights, fights every single game, just about. And um, I was there for a little over a month. I started that season in Dubuque, made the team out of camp. This was this was my fifth year of goalie, and that that was when I was like, "Holy oh, shit, I'm going to the NHL!" Like this is my fifth year goalie, and I just made a USHL team. Like, how are you? Um, they didn't end up bringing me to training camp. Like a week before training camp, they told me they were going to send me to the Null, and I was like, ah. No, so cool. So I had a couple options. Ended up going to Texas. Wanted to go somewhere warm, and heard Corpus Christi was the sickest place to play. So that's where I went, and uh, um, was there until like right around Thanksgiving. Uh, played a few games. Um, had a couple tough breaks. Didn't get a win while I was there. Um, my first game played well. Didn't get a win. I think my first two games in the showcase, I put, lost the first one in a shootout. The next one in overtime. And then I lost another one that was like three one, I think. Um, but it was a it was a good game. And then they brought in another goalie. There's two of us there. They released my goalie partner, bring another goalie, and we're playing Amarillo, who's the best team um, in the league at the time. And they're piss pumping us. My goalie partner's in the net. Um, it's like seven one, and uh, there's a five on three. And it was like halfway through the second, and the coach just goes, DK, go. Throws me in on a five on three, okay. halfway through the second, haven't done anything. Go, go in this game, face off, end zone, first shot, goal, five on three. Now it's five on four, second shot, save, third shot, goal. Now we're even, giving up two goals on three shots, four shot, save, puck goes down, it's nine one, and one of our guys, his name was Roman Uchin, went on to play at um, went on to play at St. Norbert, and I don't know if he's playing for Orna. Um, maybe he went to camp or something, but I'm not sure what he's doing. Uh, dummies, this guy from behind, just smokes this D-man from behind. Paul Verifato was the other goalie, uh, went on to play at Holy Cross after that. Um, but him and – this was Saturday night. He, him and I both backed up Friday night and we're shooting shit in the bench the whole game. Like, game buddies. He was playing this night. Delayed penalty. He goes skating to the bench, stops, turns, jumps the guy who dummied uh, his guy from behind. And then all of brawl, everyone just swarms over there, all nine skaters. And then I was like, this is my chance to get out of this game. Like, um, I'm not an aggressive guy. I'm not mean unless I have to be. Um, so more so I was like, okay, this is my chance to get out of here and to just start some noise. Like, goalie fight, like, let's do it. Who doesn't want to get in a goalie fight? So I go skating all the way. This was in the far end. So I go skating all the way down. As I'm coming up to the red line, because once I get across the red line, I'm EJ automatically, whether I touch anyone or not. Um, I'm looking at the bench to see, like, am I going to get yelled at? Am I getting screamed at right now to stay? And he's saying, go, go, go. So I just remember seeing that. And I was like, all right, we're getting out of this game. And I go over to the pile. Um, the, the goalie and the one player are tied up with the ref. And then I turn, and just a swarm of people are coming in to me. And I just remember, like, dropping a glove. I had, like, had my arms around two guys and took a quick peek. I'm a righty thrower. Um, this guy was smaller than this guy, so I let this guy go and chose to fight the skill guy instead. Um, didn't take my helmet off, which was, that was not cool. That was the one thing I was not happy about. That's that's savage. If you're going to get in a fight, you better take your own helmet off. As a goalie anyways, 
So, but I didn't have any of my gloves off. I like were gripped up and I put my gloves off and then he ends up getting my helmet off. And I was a little, little chunky at that point, my first couple years of junior. So once we get gripped up, I throw a couple punches, but he had a good grip of me. So I don't connect with any, um, don't think he connected really with any either, but I got tired. <laughs> I got tired pretty quick. I remember that. So then I like just wrestled him to the ground, like pulled him to the ground, got on top of him. And this was another like scummy thing Threw a couple, like, savage ground pounds, <laughs> ground punches. And then uh, the goalie came over, and then I just held him down because I was exhausted. <laughs> and goalie comes over, like, pulls me up, and I'm thinking, oh, I was like, are we going, are we going? He's like, no, no, like, we're done. I'm like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> when are we going to get to do this again? And um, then ended up going, get kicked out of the game. I ended up being in that game for two on, if you can look, uh, I think you could still look. It was on Elite Prospects or at least on my Hockey DB or whatever. That game, two goals, two goals against on four shots and a fight with an ejection with a total amount of two minutes and 59 seconds played in the game. <laughs> so with just under three minutes, I was able to give up two goals, make two saves, and get, get in a fight and get booted. Um, and that was my last game in a Corpus Christi jersey. Um, <laughs> a kid got sent down that day from the USHL, Hayden Stewart, who a um, good buddy of mine, shout out to you, Hayden. And uh, he went on to play at Cornell and then is playing in the SP now. Um, uh, great goalie as well, big guy. But uh, he was a kid who got sent down. He got sent down from Muskegon. So he was actually watching that game. He was at that game with his parents watching that game. And was probably like, holy shit, like, what, like, here's a USHL kid who has, you know, for all brand new CCM gear because he spent the first month there and he's coming to Corpus to play a few games. Like, I don't think he stayed there all year. And um, it was probably just like, oh my God, like, what is this? But uh, so that's, that's that story. And then I guess fast tracking a little bit to my next fight, which was my first year pro. Um, I made the adjustments. I took my own helmet and gloves off before I started throwing punches. So. At, at least you got. Was, at least you got the gloves on. Yeah, I got the gloves off this time. But South was fun, man. Um, especially being like a 16, 17 year old kid. Like we had some of our guys had billet houses on South Padre Island, which is like I think where they have girls go gone wild, like spring break. Like it was it was pretty surreal feeling. First time moving away from home, and I'm, here I am, kind of living in like a a small city with a beach town, like just playing hockey, like not even doing school. So. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. So you got, you got both gloves off when you got in that fight. Yeah. So the, uh, the faith that was against Macon. Uh, it was a, it was a heated game. I think we lost three, one game was over. And one of our guys uh, was just John, John and their guys, everyone kind of swarms around center ice and pushing and shoving, gripping. Nothing like serious has really happened yet. Just face face washing, grabbing, and things are starting to get intense. And then I was thinking about doing something stupid. I wanted to do something stupid, but I wasn't just going to attack because uh, I was pretty pissed off after the game. Like it was a good game, just one of those games. Like just one of those games. Um, and. Uh, out of nowhere, I see this one of their players blindside one of our D-men. His name is Paul Fregu. Uh, he's playing in Peoria now. Um, and just suck, sucky bombs him from the side. Like, he's looking this way, doesn't even see it coming. And I just saw red and snapped. And that was probably the first time I've ever, like, truly, like, lost my marbles. And, like, I just charged this guy. I speared him right in the stomach, like, as hard as I can drop my stick, drop my gloves, rip my helmet off, like almost all at once. It happened so fast. And I just started donkey, throwing Donkey Kong punches. And uh, eventually, like, pile swarmed me and eventually got tackled and sat on by, like, three guys. One guy's face washing me while I got, like, three guys on top of me. My guys are trying to rip guys off of me or, rip, yeah, rip guys off top of me. And uh, it all happened pretty quick. And I'm getting – I think three games. I had three games just before it. Um, it was originally, I want to say it was like originally like 10 or 
or something stupid, five maybe. And I was like, yo, like, that's crazy. Like, they have to watch this video and see why I did it. Like, I wasn't the initiator. But, At that point, you, gotta, you just got to defend your teammate there. Yeah, and, um, you know, at the time, it probably wasn't a smart decision. The goalie partner was called up, and um, we had a college kid in uh, who had only practiced a couple times with us, I think. Once, maybe once, once or twice. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he had just gotten in and was kind of emergency backup uh, for that weekend or just signed, like, a PTO. So my partner got back and I kind of sewered him and he obviously had to go out and play the next game and played pretty well. But um, just me being the starting goalie at that point, um, you know, for that team that season, it wasn't probably wasn't, wasn't the best at the time. Like I just kind of got lost in the heat of the moment and thought I was doing the right thing, protecting my teammate, which at the end of the day, yes, you should always protect your teammate, but, me in that situation being the only goalie and playing a good team like Bacon, um, I should have sat back and let somebody else kind of take care of that. As the goalie, it's not necessarily my job. and um, That's just one of those examples where you kind of got to try and control your emotions and yeah. bottle, bottle, up, bottle up that fire that I have a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah for sure. So uh... – Fast forwarding a few years to uh, this prior season, you played for both Danbury and Peoria. So, what was it like having a uh, getting a uh, being to becoming a backup to a uh, good friend of the show, Eric Levine? Like, he's a what's it like uh, being his backup? Man, he's the Levy's the man. Um, it was a pretty this past year is a pretty tough year for me. Uh, I was so fortunate in Fayetteville to, to go in and just be the guy for like the first time ever, right, in the last four years and be the starter, get a call up, um, have a good first season and uh, re-signed in uh, this year, not re-signed, but signed this past year in Evansville and things didn't go well for me there out of camp. And went back to school to train to figure out what I was going to do next and Dan Mary came calling to give me an opportunity and Thought it was a good opportunity to just go play some games. So I called back up to the SB and went there and joined an unreal group of guys at Danbury before going to to uh, Peoria, where I met, met Levy. Um, and got to join an awesome, awesome program there. Uh, and that was just super cool, man. It felt like I was kind of back in Adrian again, like on, on the powerhouse. Uh, had the best goalie in the league in Eric Levine and um, some of the best players. And um, – some older guys that have been around the league and were still tearing up the league. Uh, so I was just super excited. And I knew there's probably three or four guys from Fayetteville who are on that team. So I couldn't have been more excited going into uh, to that situation. I, I, I knew going in I was going to be a backup, but I knew how to play that role and I knew how to fill that role perfectly. So I was, I was just super stoked. Like the way I was looking at it was if I can play 20 – 25 games this year. Levy's going to take the bulk of the load. I put up gross numbers. I'm going to get an opportunity in the coast. A guy at my size, Levy wasn't taking call up. So if they needed a guy, they were going to take me. Um, so just be a good teammate and learn as much as you can from Levy because he won a national, or won a championship uh, the year before with Newfie. And I actually got to play against him when I had my call up. Um, he got to see, watch him play. Because we went to Newfoundland when I was in Adirondack. Uh, so I was, was super excited to, to meet him. And I knew he was a big yogi, too. And I was just then kind of getting DK Mobility up and rolling, trying to get that uh, headed in the right direction. And just to learn stuff from him, man, his daily habits, like, you know, the work he puts in and just the way he enjoys it. I think the biggest thing is that guy loves going to the rink. He's the first one there, just loves hanging out. Um, at the rink, whether it's playing ping pong for three hours after practice or whatever, doing yoga, meditating. He's just, he's such a pro. And him being a goalie coach too, it was awesome because it was like I was getting private lessons every day in practice. So um, I've always been a guy who loves skating and loving on the ice. So I would stay out as long as I could. And he was the same thing. 
it almost got challenging at times because as a backup, you know, it's your job to stay, be the last guy in the ice, stay out there after the starter. And But Levy would freaking stay out there for 40 minutes after practice. And Peoria's practices were a lot more like NHL practices, I felt like, because he took most of the shots. So, like, most of the drills were out of one end, and I was kind of just hopping in to, to give him a break. And it was my job to get my work before and after. Um, and here's this guy. He's like, you know, I'm, I don't want to get off the ice before Levy. Like, he just did a full practice, took the majority of the shots. But now we're 45 minutes in it afterwards. I'm like, damn, this guy won't get off the ice. And, like, you know, we both usually just take our own end. Um, but it was just awesome to see, you know, an older guy who's been there. He's having that success, and it's no question why he is having the success that he is, both in, the, in his business with his goalies that he trains and in his own practice as a goalie and as a yogi. So um, it was super. I, I wish my time could have been longer there. Um, unfortunately, it just, just didn't work out, and that's just that's business sometimes. Uh, I played great. I played well when I was there and got along really well with the team and got, got along great with Levy. Um, we just – I had two starts and wasn't able to get a win. And at that point, you know, whether it's, it's my fault or the team just not playing well in front of me, uh, being on the number one team, he felt like he needed to, to make a change because uh, we just didn't have the best game in front of me, the two games. And that can make you question things. So um, it had nothing to do with, you know, him having faith in his team because at the end of the day, all those guys on that team, I felt like could be on coast teams. And – they were by far the best team in the SP. Um, it was just, it didn't work out. Just vibe wasn't there, those two games, whatever. And um, I got to go back to Danbury and play a bunch and uh, continue having success there. But uh, yeah, man, Levy, Levy was awesome. I hope he's listening. Um, hope you're doing well, man. And uh, I'm curious to see what he does. I know he was originally planning on retiring and having this beast last year. He, if it is, I mean, he went out with an absolute bang, being MVP of the league and goalie of the year. Uh, but I know he wants a, wants another championship. He's such a competitor, such a hungry guy. And um, just learning learning that from him as well. Having a guy, you know, you know, seeing a guy get his ECHL championship ring, showing it to all the boys, and then going out immediately after for practice 30 minutes early, going, staying on the ice for an hour practice and then staying out again for another 45 minutes like it'd be pretty easy on that day to be like yeah I got this ring like just you know be on your high horse and it's easy to be like yeah I'm gonna get off a little early today like you're just feeling good whatever and but no man like that shit didn't matter to Levy like every day was a work day and um, that's what I try and pride myself in yeah for sure Levy Levy's a great guy you also know uh, another good friend of the podcast uh, Jamie Phillips as well yeah so we're we're getting him back on next week. So you got you got to listen to that one when it comes out. Heck yeah, man! I will for sure. He uh, Jamie's a good dude too. Um, I actually connected with Jamie in junior. Um, I bought a pair of goalie pads from him from when he was at Tech. He was at Michigan Tech, and I was playing in Austin. And I bought a set of his old gear. And that's kind of how we just started shooting shit. And then eventually started texting, and then we'd have phone calls, and then we're Facetime became buddies and um, I ended up going out there the summer before my senior year to go to pro camp uh, that the goalie coach he works with, uh, Derek Bujan, Bujan goaltending, went out there in uh, Caledonia, went to that pro camp with Jamie and Buj and uh, Alex Murray was there who ended up being my goalie partner in Fayetteville, that's where I met him, um, some other really good goalies uh, were there as well, Justin Fazio who's playing in Italy. Uh, who else? Uh, Elaine Truly, who went on to play for uh, one of the teams in China, um, was a sick goalie, played at UConn, was probably like one of the best D1 goalies at the time when she was there. Um, and that was a that was a sick experience. That was like it was like three days. Jamie let me stay right at his house. Like I never met him in person. And he let me stay right at his house uh, with him and uh, Foz. And uh, we had a great time connecting with all those guys, and I really hope I can get back out there, uh, hopefully this summer, to uh, to train with uh, train with Booge. And I know 
know Jamie's heading off to grad school again. He's he uh, just he just booked the the job as Michigan Tech's goalie coach, which is sick. So he's moving back out there um, as soon as he can. But hopefully, I get to see him sometime this summer. Yeah, it seems like ho- hockey's just a great community. Just like no gets to know everyone. It's like a small community. It's it's awesome. Hundred percent, man. And Jamie was, you know, I was just some. It would have been super easy for him as, you know, a kid playing. Anyways, it would have been, you know, Jamie was playing D1 where it was him and Phoenix Copley who – Phoenix Copley's in the AHL. It's been, I think he's in the AHL. Is it, was he in the AHL this year? I know he was Washington's backup there before. Yeah, but yeah, so, you know, two – probably two of the best goalies in college hockey. Um, two top goalies in college hockey, let's say. And I was just some junior kid uh, blowing him up, uh, looking for gear and – little gear nerd and it would have been super easy for him to like just been like oh this kid's annoying like but he was he was great for me man he was a really good mentor and um really helped me just kind of through that whole junior hockey process but uh, yeah for sure yeah Yeah, for sure they're they're both awesome guys and so this this season you spent most of the year with uh dan barry so like take us through like your your season with Danbury and like how you think it went overall? So for me this year, I haven't even told anyone this, so this is gonna be some uh come I'm coming out of the closet here, so to speak. Um this year was not an issue of skill for me. Um I was I felt I was one of the best goalies in, in the SB my first year as a rookie. Almost I was an all star nominee and I came into this year with like High expectations, like knew I was a top five goalie in the league, and I still believe I'm a top five goalie in the league. Um, for me, it was mental, man. I went to Evansville and just got there and had an eerie feeling. Um, and part of pro hockey and even junior hockey is coaches are going to tell you things that aren't true. And I went in there with an expectation that wasn't true, and things didn't work out. I went to Danbury and was able to find my confidence again. Um, it was hard. It was hard. You know, I, I was training at school before going to Evansville and, and hanging out with all my college buddies, had all these high high hopes, and, you know, <clears throat> guys asking about what my situation is going to be and me telling them all this stuff that I was told. And now a week later, here I am, I'm back and I got cut. Um, so like that was pretty embarrassing and um, definitely tough on the confidence, but um, just – Feel that fire for me, and I just got to work when I got back there. And uh, when Dan Mary came calling, it was an opportunity to go play every game, and that's what I wanted to do. So um, I knew I was going to go in and dominate that league. Um, I know I can dominate that league, and that's what I did. I went in and played nine games. Dan Mary hadn't won a game yet. They were like 0 and 4, and we were going to, I think I got there on like a Wednesday night at like midnight, maybe. And then we were leaving Thursday. We were skating Thursday morning, leaving Thursday afternoon to to go to Carolina to play the Thunderbirds in Carolina for their home opener ring ceremony night because they just won it all. Each guy's getting their ring. They're raising their banner. It's their home opener. Sold out crowd both nights, like 4,000 people. Um, and probably to this day, it's probably the rowdiest building I've ever played in. Um, without question, like most fans just – probably the loudest atmosphere I've been a part of even that and it's probably right up there with Newfoundland um but you know they, and they hadn't lost a game all year yet and then so I skated with the team Thursday skated Friday morning and they're like yeah you're playing this weekend if you can get here you're playing so skated Thursday with the team um took morning skate Friday went in play started Friday night we beat them at home three two at 43 saves, give them their first loss of the year. And then we go out the following night, we lose in like 6-5. It was like a, it was a barn burner. And uh, that was one thing to learn about the Fed was, um, and that was something I was told coming in was, don't worry about how many goals you give up. Um, like after that weekend alone, I had like over 80 shots against. Um, wow. And, you know, there's a lot of breakdowns. Like, I mean, it's, it's every league, right? the lower you get, the more breakdowns there are, yeah. the more mistakes. So um, that's just the way the way it works. Um, 
So that's what they – everyone always don't – like, if you give up – they say if you give up, like, three goals in that league, it's pretty much a shutout. Like, if you're giving up two, two, three goals, like, consider it a shutout sort of thing. Um, but um, that was just super fun. The guys there were awesome, super welcoming, and um, just very inviting. I felt like – felt like I was able to just go into that room and just be my natural, like, goofy, fun self, whereas um, – in Evansville, I felt like I was a little more timid, a little more laid back, just had an eerie feeling. Um, and I just wasn't myself. I, I didn't, wasn't comfortable. And I just knew something wasn't right there. I, I trust my intuition a lot. And, um, I just knew something was off. And I got to Danbury and things felt great. And, uh, you know, played nine games. And I think I went nine and one or something like that, or eight and one uh, before getting called to Peoria. Um, it was just great to get my confidence back. And then going to Peoria was, was great, but it was also tough, right? I was switching gears from, I, I had just played 10 straight games. Now I'm, I know I'm coming in to be a backup, but, uh, but I was back in, in the SP where I wanted to be and I'll ultimately work my way up to a coast call, however that may be. Um, and, uh, you know, played well, had confidence, but my last game in Danbury, um, I, I popped my ankle. I, not, I think it was, they said it was like a mechanical impingement. So for like the first week, I got I got lucky because I got called off right at the time that the team in Peoria had like a six day break. So I was able to stay off the ice for six days, get treatment. And I stayed right in Peoria, or sorry, right in Danbury to get the treatment uh, right up until it was time for me to get there. Um, and the first couple of days, like the first skate, I couldn't put, I could hardly skate. Like I ended up getting off the ice, I think. Um, uh, we, we did like a scrimmage and I could hardly put any weight in my ankle. Um, and it was only whenever I like, when, when I went to go down, there was like a small point in that range of motion that would just like throb. And it would just make my whole foot go numb. Um, so it was just a, a tough time while I was there trying to rehab an injury. Um, it was good that Levy was there and taking up most of the game. So yeah. it gave me some time to stay on the ice and practice and uh, try and heal that ankle. I, after being, you know, I felt like I handled the situation well, with all the variables I got thrown at me, but um, I had some, some, uh, I was sour leaving there. I felt like I wasn't given the best opportunity just in the sense that both games that I played were, on their away games on the back end of uh, different events. So the first start was the last game before Christmas break. And then um, the other game was a, an afternoon game on, um, on New Year's. So tough games get motivated for, motivated for as a team. They always end up being weird games. But as a backup, those are the games you're going to get. You're going to get the, you're going to get the shit starts. So you got to be able to handle them. Uh, I felt like I did that. Uh, I, I guess the only the thing I was more upset about was just that I only really got to show myself two games, and I'm not even healthy. Uh, at that point, I still felt like I was maybe like 75% healthy. <clears throat> um, still having some pain, constantly doing rehab on it, uh, getting treatment. So that was just a tough part. Um, just that I wasn't wasn't able to give them my hundred percent and show them everything that I have in the tank. Um, but I was able to go back to Danbury, finish my rehab, and uh, you know get my game back under me, work through some kinks that I had just coming out of injury, and uh, had a goalie coach there every day, and Matt Boydie with Boydie goaltending, he was awesome. Worked with him every morning before practice. Uh, so and again, had an awesome group of guys there and we had a lot of success so it was a lot of fun yeah for sure so yeah so me and Tyler Tyler and I actually went to uh, Peoria to see Levy and you were you were the backup for one of those games as well so oh sweet so I, I remember seeing you and during warm-ups and it was uh I'm pretty sure I sent you a, a message after and I was like and I think I saw you and I was like and I just said something something yeah like yeah you, I do remember that you were just like, yo, like, saw you play, like, something, just something like that. It was something nice, yeah. 
Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, but, no problem. Um, honestly, man, this this year was – sorry, I kind of went on a tangent there, but uh, what I was going to come out about was, um, you know, I had such a good fresh rookie year, playing all the time automatically and, you know, had a tough bounce in Evansville. And the first half of the year had quite a bit of travel, you know, going to Peoria, then getting sent back. And it was – January and I'd only played like 12, 12 games this year. So I was dealing, I was definitely struggling with it mentally. Um, this was much more of a mental battle than anything for me this year. Uh, I, I almost felt like I was, a, it was another year as a rookie, to be honest with you, because my rookie year really wasn't like a, your standard rookie year where you're the backup and you're in and out of stars and you have some tough bounces. Like, Everything just kind of went well for me in my rookie year. And um, I guess I had that sophomore drought, if you want to call it that. Um, just I had some shit bounces. And uh, I know my game elevated. I proved that when I went to Danbury and just started putting on a clinic in these games that I was getting, you know, four or five B-ways a game, two on O's, and, like, no one could get anything by me. Like, it was, it was awesome to just build that dominance back in my my own head um, and that's ultimately why I chose to stay in Danbury the second half of the year. Um, I had a couple of call-ups right after getting back from um, Peoria, one of those places being Fayetteville and a place I that was really hard for me not to go back to because I loved it there. I loved Jesse as a coach and um, loved the guys that were still there but they had they had a starter there who was killing it and I knew the situation probably wasn't going to be beneficial for you know my mindset my, my mental game that I needed to to work on and I felt like for me it was best if I just stayed put in Danbury and got the games and just kind of sucked it up and grinded through it and, you know enjoyed my time with this great group of guys and this successful team and uh, you know win a championship you know, my decision to stay there was okay we're you know we're kind of we're fighting it mentally and we're going to go back to Danbury. We're going to figure that out. We're going to grind through this mental thing and we're going to learn from it. And we're going to win a ship here in Danbury, put that on the resume, prove that, Hey, I can be the guy to carry a team through playoffs and win it, win a cup. And, you know, that way this, this year I have an awesome, awesome off season and come back ready to kill it wherever I end up. Uh, and I feel like, unfortunately, we weren't able to get the championship thing done because of Corona, but uh, I was able to work through that mental side of things and uh, definitely learned so much this year. That just has me very excited for what's to come. And um, now I feel like my mental game has taken those next steps the same way my physical, the physical side of my game has, and I'm just ready to make some noise. So yeah. just like I know you are. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, so going back to like the Evansville tryout, like you get cut and you, you didn't play for like a few months there. So like, yep. what was like, how'd you stay sharp during like those times that you, had, you didn't have a team you're looking for a team? Like what was the mindset there? So luckily for me, I was, um, I was able to go back to Adrian, um, I was able to go back to Adrian and skate with the boys, got to skate with the team, which was nice. So I was practicing every day. Um, I was staying in shape. Like, I was in practice shape, you know, skating two hours a day. Um, had an awesome gym, like, access to an amazing gym in Adrian that I could use so I could stay sharp. And um, I think the biggest thing for me, again, was I was just antsy mentally. Um, but I also used it as a learning curve. You know, something Jesse would always say to us at Bay Bill is, you never know when your career is going to end. Um, and so you, you hear it like, well, you don't know what you got till it's gone or time flies, appreciate your days in high school because before you know it, they're going to be behind you, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, yeah, whatever. And then you're 25 and you're like, shit, high school is a decade ago. Um, that was kind of a reality check for me. Just like, you know, you hear it like hockey could end for you tomorrow. And it's like, yeah, you're right. But, Within, you know, you're like, yeah, I plan on playing pro for four or five years. Like, I still have goals to make to the AHL, NHL. Um, so, like, you're listening to it, you're hearing it, but it's not totally setting in, right? Um, and at that moment, it just really set in. And 
Um, it's like, well, at this point, hockey has ended for me. I don't have a team to play for. Um, you know, it's training camp. All the SB teams have their guys. Everyone's healthy. No one has had an opportunity to shit the bed yet. So, you know, coaches are going to give their guys opportunities, see what they got before they're making any sudden movements, any changes. So I really had to be patient, just stay focused on my process. And um, it helps spark DK mobility. Um, I was driving home from Evansville in the dark, wondering what the fuck I'm going to do next. You know, hockey's ended. So, you know, I, I knew another opportunity was going to come, but it just made me okay. Hockey has ended. So when you get your next opportunity, you need to, one, take full advantage of it, and two, really appreciate it. Because um, it just, I don't know, it showed me how lucky I was to have the opportunities that I get or that I've gotten to play. Um, and that being said, I was like, okay, what am I supposed to do? Like, what if I don't get something? Like, I have a degree in exercise science. I had ambitions to – become a personal trainer, become a mobility specialist, but I hadn't really taken any steps towards actually doing any of that, whether it was because I didn't want to take the time to be and become an online trainer or didn't know where to start or uh, didn't want to be judged for trying to just start something out of the blue. I mean, you can come up with a million reasons not to do something in your head if you want to, right? And, you know, that happening for me was just like – kind of the, uh, the look in the mirror that I needed to be like, okay, it's time to start something because eventually hockey will end and you need some sort of revenue. <laughs> you need something um, something else to be passionate about. <clears throat> um, and I knew if I set something up as well, because obviously in the minors, we don't make the most money. So if I set something up that can help generate some extra revenue for me and um, to, to be a backup plan, so to speak, for when I am done playing, I just have something in motion that I can focus all my time towards. It's going to take a lot of stress off me during the year while I'm playing hockey because I'm not going to have to worry as much about money and all that shit. So that was the birth of DK Mobility. I was like, okay, I'm going to get home and I'm going to start an online personal training business. And um, I was listening to a podcast uh, called – it was by Brian Bouchard, and it was – Shit, I can't think of it. Uh, it was high performance habits. Um, or it was like high performance people. High performance people and the habits that make them that way. It's called high performance habits. Uh, high performance people and the habits that make them that way. So, and one quote that this guy said was from Andy Warhol and it goes back to that making excuses thing and the quote is don't worry about making art and if people are going to like it or not make art and put it out there and while people are deciding whether it's good or not make more art and that just connected with me because for so long I was putting off starting this business or doing something like what I'm doing now because I didn't want to be judged or I didn't feel like I was qualified because I didn't have my certifications yet. Or, you know, uh, I had been out of school for a little bit or, you know, whatever. And when I heard that, I was like, okay, like, that's what I got to do. I just got to start putting stuff out there. I know I have knowledge and I know I have wealth to give to people. And I just got to start putting stuff out there. And if it sucks, it sucks. I just keep making stuff until it gets good. Um, and, Hadn't it been for that, who knows if I'd be where I'm at now where, you know, since quarantine, you know, when quarantine started, I had, I didn't really do much with DK mobility during the hockey season. I was posting videos here and there, uh, posting stories, but I didn't really have any serious direction with that. I was just trying to get content out. That's all, that's my focus was just get content out. Um, you know, try and reach the hockey people, try and reach people just trying to improve their mobility. I didn't really have a, focus like I do now and once quarantine you know started I was really able to focus in on it that's when I was like okay I'm focusing my I'm narrowing things in towards hockey goals um, and you know that's how I'll build my following and you know other people will see it too uh, coaches will see it 
hockey players will see it and they'll see that there's benefit in it for them as well. And those people are still going to want to train with me. Um, and over the two months of quarantine, I've been able to build my business from zero to a hundred. And I have, I've gained almost a thousand followers in the last two months. Um, I've gained 70 um, YouTube followers that, you know, when quarantine started, I didn't even have a YouTube channel. And now I've got a YouTube channel with, you know, 70 people following it and very subscribed to it and um, an email list and a website and just all this stuff that, you know, back in August seemed like it was so going to be so hard to do or impossible to start. Um, and I, that's part of the reason why I thank Evansville for, for screwing me over the way they did. Like, uh, I, I guess you can call it screwing me over if you want, but um, ultimately they didn't screw me over because now they've made essentially made my business um, that I'm going to have for the rest of my life. That's hopefully going to make me a lot of money. So um, that was kind of the learning curve for that. And once again, it goes back to everything happens for a reason, right? Tyler Parks. Um, and I re remembered that, you know, get back to Adrian, like, yeah, this sucks, but something's good. Something good is going to come from this. Everything happens for a reason. And, um, it did, you know, my business happened. My experience with Peoria, getting called to the best team, getting to, you know, play with Levy and, uh, have the experience that I had there and meet all the amazing people I met in Danbury. Um, so and it set me up to, to really elevate my confidence in the mental side of my game. And now it's game over. If or whenever hockey season happens next, look out for Dylan Kelly. Uh, yeah, I, I can't wait to see what you, uh, you're you going to be doing the next few years. For like, I'm sure you're going to get up, get up to the AHL, the NHL soon. So that'll be, that'll be fun to watch you, watch you do. And so going back to like the – not take anything for granted. Like when before COVID hit, like right as COVID hit, like all my seasons got canceled right away, and I was like, "Holy shit! I don't have any. I don't have anything to, anywhere to go to play." So it's like, it really made me think that like you can't take anything for granted. And I, I was like, "When's the next time I'm gonna get on the ice?" And it hasn't been for two and a half months, besides for last Monday. So it's like, it's like holy shit, that's a long time. For sure, man, and it's – I hope this time has been um, – I know it's been a shitty time for a lot of people, but I hope it's been good for a lot of people. Um, you know, honestly, quarantine's probably been the best thing that has happened to me. Um, yeah, so. And as far as just building some stability in my life, being a minor pro hockey player, there's no such thing as stability. You're, you live somewhere under the team's, you know, circumstances for – eight months if you're lucky enough to not get traded or released and then you move home to probably work some sort of summer job to make money to go sign hopefully the same place if you're lucky if not somewhere else so stability is non-existent in the world of minor pro sports and um, I felt like that was maybe something that was giving me a lot of stress and anxiety um, and you can't look for others to give that to you. You can't look for, for others to give you that stability. You have to go out there and get it yourself and take, take the proper steps and the initiative to, to find a way to find it. And that's what I did. And that's what I used this quarantine time for to really dial in my daily habits, dial in what it is I need to do as a trainer, as a mobility specialist, as a hockey player, as a pro athlete, just as a person. Um, and I'm better because of it. I'm stronger. I'm stronger physically and mentally than I've ever been. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, receiving more success than I probably have ever had just cons on a consistent basis, day-to-day -day basis, uh, whether it's selling a program or just getting better at something, whatever it can be, just every day there's growth. If you put some sort of plan in in order for you to follow every day, it's impossible for you not to see growth every day. And all that does just elevate you, man. So um, I hope most people have used quarantine to do the same. I know you have, 
and you should let that give you a ton of confidence as you know rings start to open and let that stick in the back of your mind that you're above you're ahead of the game right now you're ahead of a lot of people man a lot of people are you know now that ice is coming back now they're thinking okay i gotta start training again i gotta start doing this again i'm gonna try and start getting on the ice you've been doing that the last two months now you're getting on the ice the only thing now is we're here everyone else is here we can't get complacent we got to keep going so that we're, we don't get caught up to um but yeah yeah bro yeah exactly it's like i've been off ice training constantly every, every day i've been doing the hip mobility stuff i hopefully found some camp that i could go to in the next year or so to Sweet. try try to go pro like like i like i told you i got that offer from waterton to go to the free agent camps there so hopefully that come hopefully that goes well and awesome. getting on the ice again so it's like everything's going up from here absolutely dude and that's all you can do is stay positive stay focused on yourself what you got to do and believe it's incredible what you can do if you believe in yourself yeah, and, exactly. uh, that's the number one thing at the end of the day someone else is always going to doubt you and it's up to you to to accept that and let it fuel you, feel your inner drive, and feel your own inner belief. Um, yeah. Because it's easy. I mean, it is easy if people are down you to be like, shit, maybe I am wrong. Maybe I'm not who I think I am or not capable of what I think I can do. It's easy to do that. Um, but, like, you look at Michael Jordan, anytime someone doubted him, man, it was game over. So, um, you can do the same thing. Keep that inner belief, that inner drive going. The sky's the limit. Yeah, you just gotta have that Michael Jordan drive, and like you said, this guy's the limit. Absolutely, bro. Yeah. So uh, for the last part that I want to get to for this uh, interview is, uh, so you start, so like you said, you started uh, DK, the mobility guy. Uh, this past, you built it from the ground up this past year. It's so, like, what has been that like whole experience like? And like, you're now doing like hip mobility classes. You're doing like Net Ninja. I know, and, like what's that whole experience like it's been awesome man it's been a learning curve um for sure i mean i started i started an online business with no idea of what it takes to run a business or an online business um i have the knowledge as far as i have the knowledge with the training i know i have the stuff but i know there's more that goes into structuring to make sure you're getting the most like engagement out of your followers and uh, your stuff is reaching the most people, all that stuff. And that was stuff that I had no idea about. And as far as like just business stuff um, behind the scenes, that was all, you know, email campaigns, uh, marketing, SEO, all that stuff was stuff. It's like a foreign language. And, and to a certain extent, it still is like, I have, I have people in place, team in place that help, is helping me learn this stuff and, and run this stuff behind the scenes that I'm extremely grateful for. Shout out to you guys if you hear this. Um, and like when this first started, honestly, I was just flying by the seat of my pants. Uh, just throwing shit out like just okay. I, I, I didn't really have a, a method to my madness. I just knew I was like, okay, I know this stuff is important. I know it can help goalies. I know it can help hockey players and just people in general. So I'm just going to start recording stuff, putting stuff out there. Um, and, you know, once I got, I would have to say once I got back, quarantine hit, that was when I really took the initiative, the next step to be like, okay, now I need to make this a business. You know, a lot of people who I talked to would be like, would ask that question. So like, is this a business or is this just like a hobby, like some fun you're doing? And that would piss me off because in my own head, I'm like, I'm trying to make money off this. I'm not just doing this to like mess around. Like I'm not just making this shit up because it's fun. Like, no, I'm trying, there's money, there's value here. And I'm trying to make, trying to be a millionaire off this shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like that was kind of rude and it's not rude. They don't mean it in a rude way. It's just, I didn't have, any business aspect to my page. It was exactly that. It was just a bunch of, bunch of videos of mobility stuff that you could do at home. Um, so that was my goal. I'm like, okay, like 
because people are wondering if this is a business or not. Now I need to set it up so people know it's a business. Um, and um, first things first was to make some plans. And my plans are constantly changing, man. Um, and like my first program I ever put out was a made mobile program. And that was like my first project that I made. Like when DK Mobility first started, I'm like, okay, we're starting a company, DK Mobility, DK Mobility guy. My first, my one program is going to be made mobile. I'm calling it the made mobile program going to make you mobile with this plan um and it was so much shit it was like there's so much recording it was probably like i want to say it was three or four phases like maybe like a four or five month program but it was scattered there wasn't a whole lot of like structure to it there was structure to it but um i also didn't have my certs at that time so uh, there's still more knowledge that i could have had that i could, could gain and that's another thing that I use this quarantine time for. During this quarantine time, I've obtained four certifications. I've obtained my certified personal training certification through, or yeah, so my certified personal training cert, certified uh, yoga instructor certification, and my certified sports nutrition specialist certification, all through ISA, which is the uh, International Sports, uh, Sports Science Association. And I just finished recently. My most recent one was my FRC, my functional range, uh, my functional range conditioning mobility specialist certification, which is a lot of the mobility stuff that you see, like the pails and rails, the cars. That's all part of the functional functional range conditioning system. Um, so I've got all those certs now. I've got those done, got the certificates, all that good stuff. So that was a big thing that I felt really needed to do to just up my net worth and um, just build my knowledge, right? Um, and doing that, I've been able to just learn how to structure my programs more, way better. And I've reshot, like for example, well, I just reshot this last weekend, um, all of all of my programs. So I don't even offer the made mobile anymore. I deleted that one. The beginner mobility program, um, I reshot. And I'm thinking I'm going to start offering that for free to clients. This is the first I've even said of that. So draw a little, little ad drop, I guess. But uh, I, like that. Uh, I reach out all my programs. I reach out the beginner mobility, which is a full cars routine. Um, the made more or the mobility and core program, which is, um, you know, mobility and core based, uh, which could be used for an athlete if they have like, if they have a training program and they're just looking to add some core mobility, this would be a three day thing that you could add to, to your already your regimen that you're already using. And it would be great for like any coaches, parents, adults looking to just kind of improve their fitness levels, burn some belly fat and just improve their overall mobility. Um, so that was my purpose behind creating that program. I reshot that this weekend and um, I and I've actually, um, and I've actually, so I've only had one person buy the net net yet. I might not even, I probably shouldn't even say that, but I'm glad only one person has purchased it. They're enjoying it. They love it. Uh, I've had quite a few by the mobility and core and I've had nothing but great feedback on that. Um, so I've, I've updated, I've updated um, all the programs. So like, I had, I had a two cam shoot um, this last weekend. So now things are on different angles. I have a professional like camera company uh, doing all this, doing all the editing and stuff like that for me. And it's just, it's going to be freaking sweet. So I'm so excited for it. Um, and I'm that hopefully those should be done by the end of next week. And I'm definitely going to start pushing those more. I really haven't even been pushing those programs that much because I've been trying to get this video done and I knew I, I had more to give with it. Um, so now when this is done, it's going to be a two, it's a two part series, um, upper and lower body, lower bodies first, and then the upper body plan on shooting the upper body this weekend. Um, but it's not going to be something you're going to want to miss, man, as uh, it's the structure's locked in it's for goalies of all ages and it's scheduled out to be 
about a 12 to 16 week program. Um, but for younger kids, I could see it um, probably being a little bit longer. Um, again, depends on your mobility abilities, right? And, yeah. um, you know, how, how you're progressing. But uh, I'm just, su I'm super stoked for this. It's going to be, it's going to be electric um, once it's out. And I'll be sure to give you some de more details on that once it's done. But um, so the programs is something that I need, I'm going to plan on launching here very soon. The hip class is something that I started three weeks ago now, and I've been loving. I love doing the, the live training. I think it's way better for the clients, too, just to be able to get some live training along with the program. Um, my programs are done just like the live training. So I made the program so it's just as if you were, you know, doing it with me via Zoom. And now you're just pressing start and pause after each exercise doing your exercise and then pressing start during your rest period, listening to me, hopping into that first movement. Maybe you're sitting in a hold for two minutes and you're finishing up listening to whatever I have to say or coaching you through. And um, I just feel like with the way I have it now, you're going to be able to work through the program a lot smoother um, and you're just going to be able to get more into the program. Uh, the one thing I didn't want you to do was – Listen to me for five minutes, do an exercise for five minutes. Listen to me for another five minutes, do another exercise for five minutes. Because it's hard to get in like a flow, the flow of the workout. So that's something I really tried to make sure I nailed with this new program is that it's something you can easily just like stop, start, and do as do with me, so to speak. So that way uh, the workout just flows a lot smoother. Uh, but the hip class has been great, man. Uh, bless I think we have we've had three weeks now. I think we're up to 15 people. Um, and it's for all athletes, whether you're a tennis player, baseball player. We've got, I have a couple college baseball players in there. Um, a couple retired athletes. Um, I have a couple parents in there, a couple coaches, and then some goalies. Some goalies and some a couple hockey players as well, position guys. Um, and everyone has seemed to love it. So. It's a Facebook group. I go live in it once a week, Monday night, 6 to 7, Eastern Standard Time. We go live. We do a 30-minute mobility hip workout um, that is progressive from the week before. Um, so that way we're touching on what we did the week before and progressing on it, adding to it, so we keep improving our mobility in that hip. And I give you homework for you to work on throughout the week on your own. Um, so at the end of each, each session, you'll we'll touch on what we did before. I'll give you something new that we'll do, I'll teach you how to do, and I'll give you some homework for you to do throughout the week. Once the video is over, I can post the, the live video, the live workout right in the group, and it, you can access it at any time to do the, do the workout again with me. Um, either later on in the week or if you missed it on Monday night. Um, Jack, like you had your birthday, you weren't able to do it. You were able to go in there Tuesday, find the video, and do it just as if you joined me live. So um, if that's something that interests any of you, please DM me on Instagram, at DK the Mobility Guy. Check out my YouTube, DK the Mobility Guy, and my website, www.dkthemobilityguy.com. And, yeah, I love feedback. Jack's been great on giving you feedback. So, the more feedback, the better. Yeah, it's de it's definitely worth the uh, the money too. It's worth every bit of it. Like I I love the class. It's awesome. You get I get personally fe personal feedback from you, and it's been awesome. Yeah, man. I wanted to make I want, and I, I definitely plan on making another class um, soon. Eh, maybe in a month. I want to add a cars class, um, whether it's like a morning cars class or. Uh, do it in the evening. I don't know. I, I still got to figure out those details. What, what would be best? But uh, I think there's so much benefit in that. And I just think it would be something that would just really help people hold themselves accountable. And there is a you know a cars class that every morning they could just get up and join for 30 minutes every morning before they get their day started to do their controlled articular rotations and take care of their body. Um, 
So I, I definitely want to do something like that in the future. I'm probably going to start dropping some polls and some stuff on IG to kind of get a feel of what the interest level is. Um, but for 40, 40 bucks a month, it's, you know, the hip classes. You're getting a live session every week. You're pretty much paying 10 bucks for professional training. And like you said, the more you give me, like I love, like Jack, you put your hip cars in the group. Um, I'm a big advocate for trying to make these groups um, as interactive as could be, so especially with it being quarantine. And I mean, things are starting to open up now, but we can't exactly all get together the way we used to be able to. So uh, the more we can figure out a way to interact online, uh, just the more beneficial it's going to be for everyone. So uh, I, I really stress that, you know, people do that, take, take their own video and put it in the group for everyone else to see and, for me to comment and give you feedback on because you know it teaches everyone right like yeah i can learn from watching you and someone else in the group can learn from watching you and hear my feedback and maybe they're doing the same thing so um th that being said yes you're getting the training but on top of that if you send a video and i'm going to critique you on it so uh you're getting the, it's even more than just the the single training a week but um that's been a lot of fun man and, I'm looking forward to this Monday. Yeah, me too. It's it's just awesome. Like everything you've been doing is just awesome, especially with the hip mobility class. Like like I said, like the feedback you gave me is very helpful, and it's just you, you sometimes just have to be critiqued and to to Absolutely. do better. So it's like it's good to get critiqued because you'll actually do the thing right. And like I know, like when I was di first sent the video in, you're. I was doing it way too fast or like a little too fast. So you told me to slow it down. So I did. And it, it definitely helped a lot. For sure. Right on, man. I'd love to hear that. Um, yeah. If you can't, if you're afraid to get critiqued, how are you going to ever know if you're doing something right or right or wrong, exactly. right? Like you don't, yeah. you don't want to do something, you know, something that you're devoting yourself to, right? Like you're doing your hip cars every day. Like, you don't want to be too shy to ask for feedback because what if you're doing them wrong? Because then you're just doing something wrong every single day. So um, that's why I love that Facebook group. Um, I'm actually making all my programs Facebook groups now. So once these videos are done, the programs will be in in the Facebook group. I have a Net Ninja Mobility Facebook group made, the Mobility and Core Facebook group already made. Um, so people can start. They're private. So once you buy the program, you get added to the group. Um, I'm accepting accepting clients for those now, and once the program's done, it'll be posted in the group. And on top of that, you having the actual video to go in on, I plan on doing at least every workout one time be alive. So um, you'll have the videos, and once we get you know a handful of people in there, I'll go live and tune in if you can, if you can't, then it'll still be in there as well. So you almost have two versions, so to speak, of the whole program, one live and one recorded. Yeah, exactly. It's just, just all the information you've been saying is just un unreal. I love it. I love uh, everything you've had to say during this whole podcast. It's been a lot of fun for, both, for all of us. And Tyler, is there anything else you'd like to add before we end this? Yeah, I'm going to go back to tennis for this one. I know um, you probably know that this is the, the best shot or one of the most amazing shots you could hit. Have you ever attempted to hit the tweener? I've hit uh, three, actually, in my career. In, in matches, like in matches, like live in matches. Um, the first one I ever hit was my, I want to say freshman or sophomore year, maybe. And it was when I was playing. It was when I was playing doubles. So it was freshman or sophomore year, and I ran back to the baseline. My partner was at the net, and it was against East Kentwood, and I smacked it. Um, we ended up losing the point because their guy was like right there, and he put it away with like a, a good ground stroke. But my partner was just like starstruck when he turned and looked back at me running on this ball, and I hit it, and I it went in. And once the point was over, like the other team was even like. I really wanted to let you in that point. That was sick. <laughs> but uh, I hit, yeah, I hit two, two my junior year um, in in matches. Uh, one, one point. 
the other one I didn't. So I guess on, I've had three successful tweeners that got over the net. Two were playable, like two were landed in. The first one I just told you about lost point. The other one I won the point. And then I think the third one uh, went long or something. But yeah, I've hit the tweener and it was something we'd always mess around with um, in practice and stuff for sure. Tyler, have you ever hit that? You've you've got three more than me, dude. So that's that's <laughs> awesome. I've never had a successful tweener. We would we would do it all the time. We play it in doubles. We'd always play this game called lot ball. So uh, it was just a game where you you had to rush the net. Both teams had to rush the net. Or sorry, if you were on the one side, you had to rush the net, and then the other team would try and lob you just to help work on, you know, attacking lobs, uh, working on running back on a lob and placing a, a, a good defensive shot back, set yourself up to get back in the point. And um, so that gave us quite a, quite a few opportunities to practice hitting those tweeners. Yeah, that, that's, all, that's unreal. That's awesome. So, uh, DK, is there anything that you want to plug, like where they could reach you, like anything like that? Yeah, so um, if you're interested in mobility training, like I said, I have a Net Ninja mobility program that is goalie specific, um, to, designed to help improve your abilities in the net uh, as far as internal rotation, external rotation. Um, it's, it's full body, part one is lower body, so focuses heavy on the hips, knees, ankles. Um, I give you exercises that you can use in a warm up use every day as a daily routine um, and these this program it's designed to just improve what you have to do in the net so make make it easier for you to get into a butterfly make it easier more comfortable for you to slide into an rbh um, make it easier for you to pivot and rotate and slide on your knees or stretch out long do the splits all that good stuff um, not to mention number one thing, uh, prevent injury. The whole point of this is so that we can stretch in, in ways longer, be more flexible, be more mobile, and not get hurt trying to do it. So uh, there's a lot of prehab injury prevention stuff implemented in the program as well that I also recommend using in season to help keep the body sharp um, and feeling good. And I also have my mobility and core program which I touched on a little bit is for anyone looking to add a little more uh, core training in their regimen and improve their overall health, fitness, and mobility capacities. A beginner mobility program. Um, I'll be dropping some uh, tidbits of that on IG coming to you soon. So check that out. IG and YouTube, DK the Mobility Guy, at DK the Mobility Guy. Uh, my website to check out programs. More about me personally, what I have to offer is www.dkthemobilityguy.com. My Facebook page is DK Mobility. Go and like that, please. Leave a review if you have worked with me. Um, it'd mean a lot. Five stars. If you think of a five star guy, up to you. Um, you're check always out a my. Guy. Hey, thanks, man. Um, if you're a goalie, I have a free public group called goalie mobility that I will post video. I plan on hopping in there live at random times um, to just give you guys free, free mobility stuff um, that you can use to help improve your mobility in the net specific for goaltenders. Um, and check out my hip class once a week, live training with me, um, unlimited feedback, unlimited communication with me with all my programs and all these groups. And my email, if you have any questions, is getmobile at dkthemobilityguy.com. And, yeah. Yeah, so. If you care that you like the pod, have any questions, have some feedback, don't hesitate to reach out. And, uh, Jack, Tyler, thanks for having me on here today. This has been a blast. And it's kill. Um, it was great uh, meeting you guys, shooting the shit with you, and uh, appreciate you guys having me on.
Yeah, thank you so much, DK, for coming on. It was a blast. Glad we got to do this and uh, kill some time of you driving. So uh, it was fun. And if if you ever, uh, absolutely, uh, if you're ever in the Illinois area, just let us know. We play tennis, like shoot the shit, anything. Heck yeah, man! Let's hang out. I uh, I might actually be that way this summer, so I'll definitely hit you guys up. Hey, bet sounds good. All right, fellas, take it easy. Thanks That's for having me again. Yeah, no problem. Peace. Thanks, DK.